guy. Okay. And a guy goes to confession and he says, Forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. And the father said, What have you done, my son? And the guy said, I'm 70 years old and I just had sex with two 25 year old twins. And the father is appalled. He said, this is terrible, this is awful, I'll tell you what I want you to do. I want you to say a thousand times Hail Mary, and I want you to walk around the church a thousand times and give a thousand dollars to charity. And how long has it been since your last confession? The guy said, this is my first time. What? You're 70 years old and this is your first time in confession? How could that be? He says, I'm Jewish. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the priest continues and he says, if you're Jewish, what are you doing here and why are you telling me? I'm telling everybody. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I, I don't do actually any research on uh, catching uh, deception. Uh, I was going to uh, be in the audience and learn, but somebody cancelled. I don't know who, so I'm, I'm a substitute. Um, but I'll tell you a little bit about the research I do, which is uh, not to catch people uh, deceiving, but to tempt people to cheat. Um, so uh, I try to tempt people in many different ways to steal money from me. And uh, one of the ways we do it is with a, a die task. So imagine you were in the experiment and I would tell you that I'll pay you depending on what the die comes up on. If it comes up on six, you'll get six dollars, five, you'll get five, and so on. <coughs> But I also tell you that you can get paid based on the top side or the bottom side of the die. You get to decide. But I ask you not to tell me. So if you're an experiment, I ask you to pick a side, top or bottom. Okay, you picked. And then I say, please roll the die. And let's say it came up with five on the bottom and two on the top. And then I say, what did you pick? Top or bottom? Now, if you chose bottom, there's no problem. You say bottom and you get five dollars. But if you chose top, now you have a conflict. What do you do? Do you tell the truth, top, and get $2? Or do you change your mind, you say bottom, and you get $5? And we get people to do this about 20 times. And every time they have a piece of paper, and they write a check, I've chosen top or bottom, then they write down what the die came up on, 5 and 2, and then they indicate what they chose, and they keep on doing it 20 times. And what we basically find when people do it 20 times is that people are really lucky. <laughs> um, Nobody is perfectly lucky, but people are a little lucky, luckier than chance. Um, and also it's interesting that their luck is concentrated on the 6-1 uh, die tosses and less so on the 3-4 uh, ones. And, and that's the basic experiment and we've run it in, with many people in different uh, variations. We have some other tests. Um, but now let's think about some variations of this test. So in one variation, we get people to do the same task in one of two versions. They either do it by themselves or the significant other is sitting next to them. Now if the significant other is sitting next to them, the significant other doesn't know what's in their minds, top or bottom, but they see the evidence accumulating on a piece of paper that basically says whether these people are extra lucky or not. So what do you think happened? Do people cheat more, less, on the s or the same when they sit next to the significant other? Let's just get a vote. Uh, you're all experts. How many people think it's the same? How many people think it's more? How many people think it's less? Okay, so it's more. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Why more? Why more? Uh, Shachal is going to talk a little bit tomorrow about some, some reason for that. Um, but I'll tell you about another task we do. Another experiment, uh, imagine, also with, with Shachal, imagine that you have, you either make money for yourself, or you make money for the team. When do people cheat more? When they make money for the team. Actually, when the selfish incentive goes down, but the total for the team the total is the same, but it's also distributed with other people, people do have a tendency to be more dishonest. And we actually link all of this to people's ability to rationalize what they're doing. You see, if I'm just cheating for myself, I feel bad about it.
But if I'm cheating for a good cause, for example, all of you get to benefit from that, now it's a good reason. So all of a sudden, you sit next to your significant other, and you realize that your dishonesty has a payoff for the whole family that has to be a good thing, and, and therefore you can justify more dishonesty. Another experiment, this is also an experiment we just finished uh, recently. Uh, people come to the lab, and we describe to them this die cast. And we say, look, we have two versions of these die tasks today. And the way that they are different from each other is the payment per dot. So there's one version of the experiment that the payment is such that the most you can make is $4. Right? There's a trade-off between how many dots you get. It's not one per dollar. But the most you can make is $4. There's another version that at most you can make $40. Right? But they're equivalent in every other possible way. And then we say, please toss a coin and we'll see which one you got, the $4 version or the $40 version. People toss a coin, and no matter what they toss, we say, ah, oh, you got the low ending one, you got the $4 one. <coughs> and now the research assistant looks around to make sure that nobody's around and that the participant sees that they look around and nobody's around. They get close to them and they say, Psst. They said, listen, my boss is not here today, so I'll tell you what. You got paid $3 to show up for this experiment to pay for your bus fare. If you will give me those $3, I will pretend you got the other coin for right? So basically, the research assistant is asking for a bribe. Okay, I teach at Duke University in the US. This experiment was done at Duke. Um, how many of our undergrads do you think uh, bribed the experiment? What did they just, they just again get your intuitions? How many people think it's 10%, uh, about 10%? Uh, below 25%? If you, if you said 10, you have to also raise your hand to below 25%. <laughs> How many people think it's between 25 and 50? Uh, about 50%? How many people think it's about 75%? Anybody thinks it's be about 85? Okay, where are you from? Uh, Portsmouth. Portsmouth, okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, so it was 90%, 90%. Uh, and, and what happened after people paid the bribe? Two things happened. The first one is that they cheated more, and the second one is that they started stealing. And, and let me explain to you what I mean. So. I told you what cheating is, right? Cheating is the fact that you basically toss the die and you change your opinion after the fact that we can figure it out statistically that this is what you've done. And people make this list, and let's say at the end they sum and they say, I deserve $27. And then we give them an envelope with $50. And we say, pay yourself the amount you deserve. The amount you don't deserve, leave in the envelope. And as you leave the room, there's a big box with envelopes. Leave the money you did not make. In that, uh, in that box. And, and this gives you a chance to steal, right? And it's kind of different because you can imagine how if you thought top or bottom and it fell differently, you can probably tell yourself a story and say, oh yes, I really meant top, or I really meant bottom. You can kind of change it because there's no concrete evidence. But if you wrote $27 and then you take 28 or 30 or even 50, that's a very different kind of psychological feeling of, um, of, of theft, right? It's a, different, it's a different story. And in general, we find that people cheat but don't steal. So we find that lots of people change the top or bottom, but if we give them the envelope, they take exactly the amount they do. This also, by the way, holds for career criminals. Now, we've done this experiment waiting in the parole office for people to get out of parole, and we've tested them with the same task, and we find that people in the parole office in, in Durham, where, where I live, um, cheat in our task just like everybody else. And they cheat and they don't steal. This corruption experiment I just told you about was the first time we saw people stealing. And, and actually, it's one of the most worrisome experiments I think we've done, because if you think about it, these are undergrads who are basically honest people. And yes, you know, they come to an experiment and they cheat a little bit here and there, but in general, they're honest. And they come to this environment, and what they learn is that this environment is corrupt because the person who is running the system is telling them that they want to bribe. And just like that, they basically forget everything they've been taught. They accept the new 
the new environment and they start cheating more and started, started stealing. We've done another version of this experiment in which the experimenter asked for a very high bribe. They asked for $12. Uh, now, nobody paid them the $12. Right? It was too much as a bribe. But even then, people started cheating and stealing. So it wasn't about paying the bribe and trying to make up for it with some interest. It was about the fact that the moment you define an environment this way, people start uh, acting differently. Um, Another experiment that talks about the social contingent uh, of, of cheating, uh, this is a study, it's not a real experiment. Uh, I own a vending machine. And uh, one, in one study, we set up the vending machine uh, to say 75 cents on the outside, but to set, it was set as zero on the inside. So what does that mean? You would put your money in, no matter what you put, you press the button, you got the candy and all the money back because the machine would think that every money, every amount is more than zero, so you'll get all your amount back. And there was a big sign that says, if the machine is not functioning well, please call this number. <laughs> <laughs> and it was my cell phone number, so I could, I could track it. Uh, question number one, what percentage of people called? <laughs> they run the right. Uh, and how many candies do you think people took? Nobody took more than four. Right? The majority took either three or four. Taking five will be stealing. <laughs> and, and the intuition is that people could probably rationalize a few extra candies. Right? They could probably tell a story to themselves and say, you know, I remember this other vending machine uh, took my money and didn't give me candy. Uh, this machine has to be a close relative <laughs> of the other one. I'm just kind of rebalancing my vending karma. Uh, but, but five would be, would be too much. And in fact, we, we find that this is a, a very general finding across lots and lots of experiments. We call this the fudge factor, which is the idea that people have a level of dishonesty, or dishonesty that we can justify and we feel good about it. And what's so interesting is that this level of justification changes depending on the environment. So under some conditions we can justify more, under some conditions we can justify less. Somebody sits next to us, we feel okay to justify more because we're helping them. The environment is corrupt, we feel better. A machine took our money before, we feel, we feel better. The other thing that happened with the vending machine study was that people also called other participants to come and parti to, to participate <laughs> as well. And, you know, usually we follow other people, that's kind of hurting behavior, but in this case people wanted other people to follow them to give it more uh, justification. The, maybe the last experiment I'll, I'll tell you about is a study in which we try to do the same thing cross-culturally. Uh, so, so I grew up in Israel. Um, how many of you think that if we ran the same experiment in Israel, the Israelis would cheat more than the Americans? <laughs> <laughs> this is also a test of political correctness. Just, <laughs> just so it's clear. Um, anyway, I, I thought that the Israelis would cheat much more than the Americans. Uh, they did not. Uh, Francesca Gino, my Italian collaborator, said, come to Italy, we'll show you <laughs> <laughs> what the Italians can do, uh, the Italian cheat, uh, just the same. Um, by the way, how many people here, uh, so let, let's compare this to the UK, how many people here who grew up in other places outside of the UK think that people in your country of origin would cheat more than the Brits? More than the Brits. Where are you from? Paris, France. France? Same. The Netherlands. The Netherlands? Romania. Romania. Slovenia. Slovenia. Sorry? Sorry. Turkey. 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 Anybody else in the back? South Africa. South Africa. Ireland. Ireland. Over. US. US. <laughs> Cyprus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Singapore. Singapore. Okay, so anyway, uh, it's, it's interesting, when, it's often the case that people think that people in their country of origin cheat more, and it's an interesting whether it's kind of the opposite egocentric bias, right? We usually think 
that we are luckier than average, we're less likely, we're better drivers, we're less likely to buy all kinds of diseases, we find that most people think that their people in their country would cheat more. But we don't find evidence. Uh, so I told you we tried Israel, we tried Italy, we tried South Africa, we tried Colombia, we tried Germany, we tried uh, Portugal, we tried China, uh, we tried England, which is just the same. Uh, we tried the Canadian because they always think that they are better than the Americans. <laughs> um, <laughs> places we, we don't find cultural differences and, and, and I think it's it's um, kind of a surprising result especially if you compare for example the, the US to, to Kenya because Kenya is one of the world's leaders in corruption and you know we have the corruption index and, and we know that uh, corrupt countries are very very different so the question is how can it be that our experiments don't show any cultural differences. Are the experiments wrong? Is, is the ideas about culture wrong? And, and here is the, the basic finding. Um, our experiments are general and abstract. It's the first time people meet those things. Right? It's the first time you meet the die task or the matrix task or some other task that we do. And because of that, we don't have cultural rules that come and override those. Instead, what we have is we have a very basic task, and people use their basic psychology to deal with it. How much can I cheat and feel, still feel okay? And we're all kind of the same when it comes to that. But it doesn't mean that culture doesn't matter. But the way culture matters is on the domain by domain specific way. So culture can come and say, illegal downloads, don't worry about it. I mean, think about it. How many of you have illegally downloaded material on your computers? Right. And, and probably the rest just don't know how to do it. <laughs> it's not... <laughs> it's not a moral objection. So, so what culture do is they take, they take a domain by domain specific approach and say, we're not worried about this as a domain. Uh, you said you're from France, think about uh, the American versus the French approach to infidelity. Right? Uh, uh, Bill Clinton had uh, a little affair with uh, one of his interns, uh, Americans got crazy, uh, Mitterrand's wife showed to his state funerals with their illegitimate child. Right? I mean, very different uh, approaches of the two, the two countries. And that's basically what we find is that we have some countries feel very bad about students cheating in exams, some feel quite okay about it. Some countries, people feel bad about paying taxes, if not paying taxes, some people. And that's basically the way to understand cultural differences. It's not about the backbone of humanity. It's about domain by domain specific way. I also talked to some mobsters, and, and this was kind of another lesson in the same effect. These mobsters, when you talk to them, it looks like they have no morals, but it's not true. They have tremendous morals, but they only apply within the family. Right? Within the family, if they shake somebody's hand and they make a promise, it's solid. Outside, no morality whatsoever. <laughs> There's one exception for this. And the exception is when we run these experiments, we run them in coffee shops or in bars or universities, all kinds of things. In one version, we went to Washington, D.C. and we tested, a, and we went to a bar where congressional staffers hang out. <laughs> and we went to a bar in New York City where uh, bankers uh, from, from New York hang out. And it, this was the one place we found a big difference. So who do you think cheated more? The, cheated more, the bankers or the politicians? <laughs> who thinks it's the bankers? Who thinks it's the politicians? Okay, so the bankers cheated twice as much. <laughs> but there are two things to remember. One is that this was cheating in the domain of money, which is closer to banker than politicians. And the other thing, of course, is these were congressional staffers. These are junior politicians with lots of room for growth.
come to me and they say that uh, their kids are unable to lie. And they say it's a terrible uh, affliction of not being able to lie. And this is not a study, it's just kind of a reflection of what people tell me. But in 100% of the cases, these were kids on the autistic uh, or uh, spectrum. And I've talked to a few of those kids and they say that they, they don't lie. And one possibility is that uh, lying really requires theory of mind. So you have to uh, understand other people's perspective. And I think we get our first steps into lying by uh, being nice to other people. Right? So it's not, it's not, but you know, parents tell us to be polite to other people and, and so on. So, and, and you have to have theory of mind for that. And if you don't have theory of mind, it's really hard to develop the, the skill uh, for that stuff. And, and I, I think that's kind of a, a two-way sword, right? You wouldn't want to have kids who are unable to have theory of mind, but then it has some downside consequences as well. Now, um, the discussion was initially was meant to be between the panelists themselves. All the particular issues you want to take I, I would like to uh, follow up on that a little bit in, in terms of the idea that there is a blind skill. At least in my work, what I find is there's people who are believable. And they some and there's huge individual differences in this. You know, just, just massive individual differences. And it turns out some people are almost always believed, and some people come off as really sketchy. And it has almost nothing to do with whether they're honest or not. So if you're a believable person, when you're honest, everyone believes you. And when you're lying, everybody believes you. And if you come off as sketchy or fishy or off, then people tend to be, tend to be quite skeptical, skeptical of you. And this is true whether you're honest or not. So, so the people, the people uh, knowing that change their strategy? So if you're... Uh, well, we find it where people can, kind of like some of your studies, where people decide whether or not to cheat. Yeah. We find that people who are more believable are more likely to cheat. And the people who know that they're bad liars, uh, the, the people who aren't in the baseline, the people who are believable in the baseline um, are more like turn out to be the ones who cheated, uh -huh. and the ones who know that. I think there's a few people who just can't lie, and they, what, their strategy is just not to put themselves in situations where they need to. Um, a more question to them, if that's okay, uh, about a different topic. Case. I read one of your books about two years ago. I want to say that that writes as well as it presents. And then we really do have to buy that book. It's really very entertaining. You can, you can all tell that it's illegally wrong. <laughs> 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 so, what's the title of the book? What's the title? It's Predictably Irrational. I have a few. Uh, the title <laughs> <laughs> is called so Predictably Irrational. I don't know. I think two, three years ago. Predictably. Yeah. My question is this about it. Is we better start thinking how can we use that in our settings? And I'm interested in the insurance type of setting and the source setting. And what's interesting in those kind of settings is that you try to deter people from lying in the first place. The people that the physical claims don't lie, the sources don't lie to their source handlers. Reading your book and that, I try to combine what kind of techniques do you think from your studies we can use to encourage food value in those settings? So, so this, this is a, a study uh, in which we basically um, got people to have more reminders. So we had one study in which we asked people to recall the Ten Commandments. In our study, nobody could recall all Ten Commandments. Uh, these were people in California, so they also invented new interesting uh, <laughs> uh, But after trying to recall the Ten Commandments, they didn't cheat. And then we did a study, the study you're referring to, with an insurance company. And the only thing we did was to change when people signed. So you know, you have a declaration of signature, and usually it's at the end. And we just switched it to the beginning. And people reported to be driving 2,400 miles more, uh, but basically 15% more. Now, we don't know if they didn't cheat at all, but we know that they cheated much less. And, and, and the thing about this, um, you know, in the oral tradition, Nobody would think to go to court and swear at the end. Right? You finished your testimony, now at the end, please swear. But somehow when we do forms, for some reason, it's at the end. And, and I think we have the intuition that when somebody is in court, we want to set the discussion from the beginning, saying honesty is important here, just, just so we're on the same, on the same set and people uh, behave, 
behave well. So, so I think we need to kind of figure out how to do forms in a way that puts this front and center. And the other thing is that I think moments of temptation are really important for us to try and figure out. Right? So we all have moments in which we're tempted to be, to be dishonest. And sometimes we have an hour drive to, to make up for this. Uh, but, but once we go down the, the, the small path, uh, it's very hard to come back. And I, I recently interviewed lots of uh, criminals and also some judges. And uh, Jed Rakoff, who's the judge in the, uh, in the Madoff case, he said that he doesn't think that Madoff, for example, planned the whole thing. You know, you, you wouldn't. Your son wouldn't commit suicide and you would have an island somewhere with no extradition uh, issues if you were going to steal $40 billion, right? This is not a thoughtful action. So, so I think that lots of time what happens is people starve and they just don't know where to go and where, where to stop. And the question is, how do we create a, how do we eliminate the slippery slope? So I think basically having, thinking about people's mindset at the moment of the first ride is important. And then the other thing is, I think forgiveness is important. Imagine you started lying to somebody. Like at what point in your discussion with the cab driver, you could have said, you know what, I just made it up, let's start fresh. But if you could have if you could have that in a structured way, I think you would have wanted it. I would have wanted it, but I was quite enjoying it. <laughs> <laughs> There's a question in, in, in politics and in religion and uh, society in general is how do we create new stopping points? And how do we create places for people to uh, not to keep on paying for, for old sins to start to start a new pain? It's something that you know Catholicism got right. Right? That you basically have to have confession, you eliminate the, the, the sins of the past and you think about the future in, in a different way. And and um, so I think, I think all of those things would be, would be very effective. Steve? Well, I was going to uh, relate to one of your studies on the previous you know, the prevalence of lying in different age groups, right? Mm -hmm. And the, the finding that uh, by high school, teenagers are lying far more than adults or children, and that's sort of the peak uh, of, of deception in, uh, in their development. And so I was curious to your your perspective on why that would be the case, and maybe also Dan's perspective on how we can reduce deception, or is that okay in their development? So let me give a plug for Kim Sirota, who's going to talk about this later in, later today. Tomorrow. Tomorrow. Uh, the general finding is that deception decreases with age, uh, or at least lying does. And uh, we're not 100% sure uh, why that's the case. I, one possibility is that people just discover over time that some of the bad consequences that come from lying and learn how to avoid uh, the situations that prompt such. It might also be that teenagers just are in situations where there's a lot more uh, tempting situations than, than adults. So, so there might be a number of things. Do you have some ideas? <laughs> so, we have not uh, done, uh, we've tested people in high school. Uh, this was without their parents' consent, so we can't publish this uh, result. We basically go to high school that asked us to come and just test them and do it for fun, for education. So, um, And then we've gone up to age about 65. And again, in our task, we don't see, we don't see big differences. Um, but I think it is this issue of what are your opportunities? You're doing more new things and you're exploring more spaces and you're bumping against rules, you probably have many more uh, opportunities to be, to be dishonest. Um, I, I'll tell you what, so, so here's the thing that worries me. When I, when I talk to the, the big cheaters I've talked to, and all of them were these stories of slippery slope. I'll tell you just one of them very quickly. So this was a guy who was a cyclist. Uh, he was a cyclist for the US team went back to school to finish his uh, degree in statistics, uh, really good university, comes back to cycling, everybody else is slightly faster. Um, he, he asks his friend, and his friend gives him an address to visit a physician. He goes, there's a white coat, there's a stethoscope, somebody gives him a prescription, he goes to the pharmacy, his insurance pays for his prescription, he pays the copay, 
and he gets a drug called EPO. So it's a drug, it's a cancer drug that uh, forces the kidneys to produce more red blood cells. Really good if you want to be a cyclist. Um, he takes lots of injections because, you know, vitamins, all kinds of things. There's one more injection all of a sudden. Uh, so he takes those things, later on he discovers everybody in the team is doing it, so they do it in public, later on he moves to Italy, the Italian team, they take orders for what drugs people want, so they get more drugs than that. Then there's a shortage of EPO, um, but his friend from the Chinese team put him in touch with the Chinese factory that makes EPOs, he imports for his team, another team hears about it, they want him to import as well, so he imports for them, eventually he's a drug dealer. <laughs> um, now, now, he basically, like you think about this, right? Curiosity, white doctor, and everything he said seems so normal. He said, you know, if you, you can only take it on, on his, but he said that if the, if the pharmacy rejected his prescription, he probably would have never gone. But in the moment he met the doctor, everything else was kind of just, this is the next recipe you take. And what's also interesting is what the cycling association did. They don't allow any more injections. So it doesn't matter if it's legal or illegal, you cannot use injection. They say, you want to inject yourself with something legal? Go to hospital and get somebody else to inject you. They basically don't want this confusion to happen. And, and I think that's an incredibly uh, common path, that we do things that have on the side of dishonesty that we can still rationalize to ourselves. We say, hey, this is just an injection, just like something else that we keep on uh, behaving this way. So, so how do we really eliminate this slippery slope from the beginning? And, and when it comes to uh, kind of fly, the detection part that we think about with criminals, it's kind of a little, it's too late from that, from that perspective. So, so it's over. Uh, but, but what can we do at that, at that point to uh, not have the slippery slope continue? I think it's time to show up to the on the matter of the signature and the pledge, I think you had an interesting observation. There's some justification why the signature is at the end, I believe, because of different semantics. That at the beginning, when I pledge, I will say only the truth and so on. I make a promise for the future, whereas the signature is like I acknowledge that all the stuff that I have read so far, I agree with. And so it would make no sense to have that at the beginning before I have had a chance to read it. So we'd have to kind of change the meaning of what the signature is. I'm going to be truthful and whatever if we wanted to put it at the front. But I agree that we should have some more commitment at the beginning if we want to, do, to change the behavior. Yeah, I, I proposed this to the IRS, to the American Tax Services. I said, why don't we have two signatures? One in the front and one at the end. One for basically mindset and one for verification. And their response was that this was confusing. <laughs> <laughs> if you're American and you see the tax form, that's particularly crazy. But, but I, I agree with the idea. It's interesting that animals and children, for that matter, can announce that you know, what's happening next is going to be untrue with a play face. I mean, if, you, uh, if you're going to do out in fantasy, it's very important to announce it early in the interaction. And that's something you know, it's, it's that uh, which affects all young animals. Uh, Uh, so I wanted to pick up on the discussion you were just having around the slippery slope and where does the slippery slope begin. And part of me wonders if it's around this elusive term of credibility. Because in, in your example that what that it seemed credible. There was a doctor with a white coat and a stethoscope and everyone else was doing it, therefore it was okay. So if the if if the activity is, is deemed as credible within that particular context, does that then increase or in, introduce that fudge factor or make the fudge factor bigger because if if it's if it's seen as okay then it, or everyone else does it other people can do it therefore it's a credible act if you know if, if i'm going to be a cyclist taking it as a credible thing to do if i'm going to be a whatever then that's a credible thing to do. so i wonder if it if it links in and around the world of credibility because i think that's also quite a, a difficult term to kind of pin down and exactly say what credibility is or what credible is 
I think this, this provides a, a real challenge for uh, all of you in terms of uh, detecting a lie. So, so here's my naive uh, view, and I hope you'll forgive uh, my naive take, but I, I think that when people start the path of uh, behaving badly, um, at that moment, if you connected them to a lie detector, uh, there would be no reaction. At that moment, they would think that they're actually okay. A little bit of self-deception, a little bit of wishful blindness, a little bit of... And then, and then you take a step and you rationalize, you make another step, and, and kind of at the moment, I don't think people really think about themselves as being dishonest. I'm sure there's some exceptions, but, but most cases. And then what happens is that at some point, they realize that they'll get caught, and now things change dramatically. And now they basically have a strategy of trying to uh, do something active that will avoid either being caught or getting, or getting punished. That's a very different story, and we, and we shift from those things. And, and I think that the, the lie detector is particularly, it's a particularly challenging thing when people are at the stage when they haven't recognized what they have done. And, and that's one type of challenge. And the challenge for after they're being caught is that they're, they're basically working so hard to create a story around that. And, but those two are very, very different challenges. Um, I've been thinking about you know why why is it that when you do something in a context it's so it's so much better and it could be because you're able to capture some of those uh, specific nuances about how is the rationalization going on and what, what's happening exactly there. So so I think that uh, your task is almost impossible or you know much more difficult in this early stage and it should be thought of very differently in the stage where people know that they are. Just while we go there, but uh, I'd like people to think about any possible new directions for future research uh, in this area, which haven't been mentioned. We've got about, I think we can have 15 minutes now. I'm actually going to uh, pose one. Uh, I, this is keying off what Steve said and also the work that, that all of them in his presentation. We see this tremendous shift now to talking about cognitive load and working memory and a very cognitive approach to things. And as I was writing something about this in the last couple of weeks, I kept wanting to put in cognitive and emotional taxation, cognitive and emotional load. We aren't really studying the ways in which we get this, this uh, emotional flooding, this infusion of emotional affect that might impose the same kind of load. Or maybe it's a different, qualitatively different kind of load. So I'd be really interested to hear what all of you think about this as a somewhat distinct concept. To me, the debate between emotion and cognition is mostly a non-verbal cues and deception debate. I think that's where it's relevant. And I stay away from that nowadays. It's, I think the verbal stuff, it doesn't matter. But, but in this case, if we're talking about we get interferences and some of the things, whether it's the language choice, the strategies we adopt, the lack of strategies, a variety of things are not driven just by our, our irrational or rational processes. But there is also this notion that some of it might be cued by emotion in some ways, what Dan was talking about. You get to a certain point where all of a sudden your moral compass comes into play, and now maybe there's some affect attached to that, and your whole calculus has changed. And so I'm wondering about the extent to which we also have some kind of emotional taxation that alters the way we deal with deception. And so low stakes lies, for instance, they are neither cognitively demanding nor emotionally demanding. And when you get to the high stakes circumstance, it's not just the thought processes that are being affected. I think you've got that whole emotional system that can get engaged. And I'm wondering if that's an area we should be exploring. Well, I think in a sense, that's an area where we are going to be done exploring. And the study you heard earlier with the family leaders and that follows from uh, Dr. Leanne Tenbrink's uh, dissertation research, where she's looked at a bigger sample and examined all kinds of different uh, facial expression cues, uh, verbal cues, and body language cues. And that, in that kind of situation, you can imagine what that individual is going through. So there's a missing family member. Let's say they killed the family member. The family member goes missing. Uh, there's going to be a press conference the next day. They're going to be in front of the media, in front of the world, pleading for the return of this person. They know it's not going to be returned alive. And they're probably in front of the mirror the night before or the morning before and, and putting on the, the, their, their, 
you know, grieving face and practicing what they're going to say and all that stuff. But they're also still experiencing, some of them anyway, the, you know, barring psychopaths, are still experiencing some kinds of emotions that we wouldn't expect in sincere leaders, like anger, like perhaps disgust, self-disgust, shame, all those kinds of things. Um, that they can't escape from, really. And so they've got this balancing act of, of monitoring what's going on in their face, what's going on in their words and body. And our contention is that you really can't monitor all of those successfully because they're also powerful in that high-stakes situation. And I don't know that we've done enough to really uh, grapple with what, what all is happening to a person physiologically and psychologically on the emotional plane. I mean, Yes, we've got, we've got a whole history of emotional research. But I'm thinking about, for instance, when you deal with uh, high-level conflict and people get into this escalation and they get into an emotional flooding. And it really is going to affect not only how you're feeling, but also then what kinds of messages you do or don't craft. And it seems to me there's a very strong interplay there with the cognitive load and the emotional load. Maybe they're completely confounded or maybe not. Maybe we need to uh, distinguish each. But it seems like that's another level of pressure uh, that's exerted. And so we want to talk about strategies like Albert's talking about ways to increase the cognitive demand so we get more diagnostic cues. Can we do the same thing by increasing emotional demands that cause interferences and, and have these people betray themselves? And it doesn't have to be nonverbal, it can be linguistic. So if people try to uh, increase cognitive demand externally, for example, you tell people to put their testimony and to count back from 100 and threes and mm -hmm. continuously and, and... Or tell, tell stories backwards, for instance, all the dream research you have of others. Uh, not so much the, the, the counting backwards, but the story can tell the story and the story can do two things at the same time, try to buy storytelling.